This is the Domain Magnet Show, where you'll learn everything you need to know about buying, optimizing, and selling online businesses with your host, Michael Baraslavsky. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We've got Dan Fries. He's the founder of Next Ventures. This is a portfolio of digital companies that focuses exclusively on digital data privacy, gaming, and commerce. We're going to talk about how to succeed with affiliate content sites, particularly with a focus on organic traffic and SEO. So thanks for joining us today, Dan. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So I want to start with your backstory because it's kind of interesting. Um, You were pretty involved in what we would consider serious science, Uh, you know, not, not so much just reading the alternative health blogs, no offense to anybody, but you know, (laughs) quite serious science. Um, And then you got into publishing some stuff about cognitive health. So before you transitioned into being a developer, so why don't you tell us about that process and how you went from being a scientist to doing the publishing business and and how you ended up as a developer? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's an interesting way of describing it. Serious science, but uh, that's probably the best way to describe it being that we're in uh, a mix of online publishing where claims are dubious at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I come from, um, I, I went to university to become a doctor. I studied medicine and biology and um, out of school, I went to a post baccalaureate research program in Boston and I was studying to be a translational oncologist which just means someone who's trying to find cancer drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working in a lab. I was uh, working on different papers. And um, what I found at the time was that the other students who I was working with were all very, very intelligent, uh, probably much smarter than me. And the doctors themselves were also some of the best in the world at what they do. Uh, but they didn't seem super happy. And I don't know if that was just a reflection of where I was at, but nobody really seemed really happy with life. Mm -hmm. And um, the type of science we were doing translational oncology was basically finding drugs that were hyper personalized to each patient. And they were extremely expensive for the patients. And at each conference, there'd be some old doctor in the audience who would, you know, after, after the presenter would unveil their new drug and how it's going to revolutionize medicine, he or she would say something like, you know, what if we just spent a few billion dollars on preventative health as opposed to developing new drugs? You know, that was 10 years ago. Now it's, it's almost natural to think that, you know, people should have healthy lifestyles to avoid cancer and heart disease and stuff like that. And um, health is, I think people are becoming more health conscious, but back then um, this personalized medicine seemed to be the thing that was going to cure cancer. And now we recognize that it's, it's definitely not. So, that was happening at the time in my life where I was starting to, you know, be more open to alternative lifestyles. And to be honest, uh, I read the four hour work week when I was working Mm -hmm. in a lab uh, and it opened my eyes to the possibility of geo arbitrage and remote work. And um, I was the guy in the lab who was basically telling all the other students like, Hey, don't go to med school. Like (laughs) let's live on a beach in Thailand. And and it wasn't very well, it wasn't very well received, but um, you know, long story short, I I quit my job. Uh, I took my sort of science background and convinced a marketing agency to hire me as an analyst. Uh, So I moved to Chicago to uh, be working in a web analytics role. And then from there, started learning digital marketing, picked up a few of my own clients. And once I was comfortable, uh, you you know, doing enough digital marketing or at least faking it, uh, I, I quit my job and started traveling. And that took you out to what, Hong Kong, Thailand. Um, you've been kind of all over the place. So, so how did that progress from, you know, you were in, you said Chicago to deciding, Hey, I'm going to go take the show on the road. So just from the marketing clients that you had, and you said now's the time to do it. Yeah. I, before I left, uh, I joined a community called the dynamite circle. Probably mm-hmm. a lot of your listeners are familiar with that community. It's just a private community of online entrepreneurs and sort of, internet business owners of many different types. And I had joined that community prior to leaving because I had listened to their podcast, which used to be called the lifestyle business podcast. It's now called the tropical MBA podcast. And I had a few friends in there who were living and working in, uh, who'd done similar things and had left the U S to old Canada to to live and work in uh, Thailand or Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, Saigon was a very sort of hot place to live for bootstrappers and, um, and, you know, solo consultants. And so my first stop after quitting my job was 
my first stop was Vegas. And then after Vegas, I, I, I flew out to, uh, to, to Saigon and met the few people I knew, uh, my internet friends uh, mm-hmm. out there. Um, and then started, yeah, started this whole online business journey. And so that was about six years ago and it took a few years of struggling and trying to build things before I had a few successes. Mm-hmm. And then about three years in, I was able to sell one of my niche affiliate websites, took that success and started building a building more. And then, um, over time have built a, a portfolio of, of several of these sort of content affiliate sites. Gotcha. Okay. So that would be uh, what we're going to talk about more uh, next ventures. Before we get into that though, you'd mentioned that uh, at the time Saigon was kind of this hub for that sort of thing. Do you feel that that has shifted? So if anyone's listening and they're planning where to go next, would that be wise, unwise? How do you feel about that? Uh, it's, it's hard for me to say, I don't keep as much of a finger on the pulse of mm-hmm what the uh, hotspots are. I don't know if you call them like digital nomad hotspots or digital working hotspots, but yeah. the pace of movement now is, is much more so than it was uh, five or six years ago. There's way, way more remote workers. And, you know, it seems to me that as soon as a blog post about a, a city gets published, mm-hmm. uh, because travel is so cheap and so many people are already sort of freelancing or working on freelancing stuff on the side, there's a flood of people that, that arrives in a year. So, um, I think there's still a lot of people in Saigon and I think it's still a, a very great place and the city itself is thriving. Um, it's going through a bit of a Renaissance. And so, yeah, I think that's definitely a great place to start, but, um, it's been a while since I've sort of called it home. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure how it's changed since then. Yeah. I've been there last year and I, um, if you haven't been there yet and you're watching this or listening, anticipate that somebody will almost run you over on the sidewalk on a daily basis. <laughs> but other than that, it's great. Good coffee, good people. Uh, so let's talk about next ventures. You started to build this portfolio after having had some, some not so successful attempts that then you started having more success. You were able to sell one. I imagine, um, tell us more about that and how, you progress from your more experimental trying to make it work to a systematic approach to acquiring these assets. For sure. Yeah. So, uh, I think it's an important distinction to make about next ventures and who we are, um, that we're not, we do have a portfolio and we are, we're all, we are constantly looking to acquire businesses and websites and domains. Uh, but at our core, we are still, we still have that bootstrappers experimenters ethos. Uh, I definitely want to talk a little bit about that because I think that's what sets it apart. But, um, coincidentally enough, next venture started, uh, when I met another SEO who was basically at a similar stage to me building lots of websites, trying lots of different things. And funny enough, we met at a, uh, roadside chicken restaurant in Ho Chi Minh city in Saigon nice. drinking beer. And, uh, we decided to work together. And the first business that we started was, that was about the end of 2016. We actually just exited a couple months ago. Um, but, uh, so that was it. We, we were, we were two people, similar lifestyles, similar sort of values and similar uh, stage of life. And we just partnered together. And so, Next Ventures is a partnership between myself and that uh, SEO's name, Sia Mohajer. Uh, he recently actually spoke at the Chiang Mai conference about our, uh, some of the strategies we use. Um, and we, I think what sets us apart is we're, we're, we're extremely hard workers and we're definitely more talented operators than anything. We, we're, we've done some investing both um, in websites and into our own portfolio, but outside as well into other assets. We have a, an acquisitions team at Next Ventures. So we, we look to acquire websites where, you know, every online broker, we, we have every prospectus that they have. Mm-hmm. We're constantly building that database of data, but we try to maintain a core focus on our operator skill set, the mm-hmm. tactics and tweaks and management that constantly improves our own portfolio. Not only because I think that um, that's our edge, we, that's the edge we see versus other portfolio builders that are sort of going from that uh, builder to buyer transition, or I say maybe even operator to investor transition. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been able to leapfrog uh, a lot of people at the same level because we're, I think we're really so focused on how do we operate things better. Mm-hmm. And not only does it help us grow our own portfolio, but it, it opens our 
uh, eyes to different opportunities that we might not have otherwise seen from an investment perspective, because we know that such and such tactics work very well. We now see certain websites as very attractive buys, uh, as well. Gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting. I saw that you guys are working with, was it over 110 different affiliate programs across your portfolio? Yeah, that's probably grown even in the last month uh, as we've taken on a few <laughs> different sites in different niches. But yeah. I mean, it's an 80-20 it's a 80, 20 thing with those programs, probably even closer to like a 90-10 uh, where, you know, if you have, a, even if it's a bit large Amazon affiliate site, chances are 20% of the pages are bringing in almost all the revenue. And it's the same with affiliate programs. You know, if you have a few pages, a few programs that are your money makers, and then all the others you're sort of obligated to review because they're there. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Uh, particularly when we're doing due diligence and I'll come across a site and they've got 15 or 20 different affiliate programs they're using. I'm like, ah, all right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> month month by month, or 20 of them. Um, well, congratulations on the exit, by the way. It sounds like it was a few years, a couple years in the making, and it's always nice to wrap something like that up. You had a, a buy side focus in general, and you had worked with Wired Investors um, in the past. So when you have your mindset coming into this being you know, from an operations perspective, you also kind of have the transactional brokerage type perspective and the buy side perspective. How does that influence your your investment strategy versus your operation strategy to the extent that they can be distinguished? Yeah, it's a really good question. So when I worked for Wired, what we were strictly looking for was websites that integrated into their existing portfolio. That was the strategy at Wired and that's still what we do at Next Ventures. But let me give you an example. So uh, to better, better illustrate that is uh, Wired uh, had and maybe still has sites in the sort of like how to start a blog and hosting niche. Mm -hmm. And what they had is a proprietary CPA with one of the hosts, well-known hosts. Um, that was just through a warm relationship. It wasn't anything based on sales volume or anything like that. And but it was a really high CPA that was sort of typically reserved for like uh, super affiliates, right. you know, people doing like tens of thousands of sales per month. And so if you find a site, any site in that, same niche, uh, promoting the same offer or maybe not even the same, um, host, but another host or another equivalent of a host with a CPA that's a third of that, or even a half of that. Mm -hmm. And if you ask your affiliate partner, Hey, can I, if we acquire this, can we use the same CPA? And they're almost certainly going to say yes, because you're sending them more business. And, uh, that's a very easy way to two X revenue. So mm -hmm. that's one example. They did that in that niche. Um, one of the other, uh, deal flow people at wired that I worked with was a guy out of the UK. He was really young and he was also quite savvy at in the pet niche. And, um, he had negotiated a, a special rate with chewy.com. Mm -hmm. And so the pet niche is now is massive and getting bigger. Um, but at the time it was still, I feel like it's hadn't quite realized the potential of it just yet. And this was like, I mean, Amazon converts very well, obviously, but Chewy gave a really, really good deal. And so, you know, we were able to buy a couple other pet sites and immediately, you know, 1.5 to 2X the, the, pr the price. So um, buy side, I'm always looking for that, uh, that unfair advantage that I know, like without a doubt, I'm getting something that's so obviously a win that um, it's, there's very little risk uh, from a buyer perspective. Um, from an operator perspective, uh, I guess operator wins aren't as clear cut to me. Um, what I tend to think of as a juicy site from an operator perspective, if I'm coming, if I'm looking to acquire it, looking to acquire some equity in the business, I'm thinking of what is generally the thing that's missing that I have that fits with my skill set. So, my skill set is content marketing, PR, and SEO. Um, I'm looking for sites that generally um, aren't, uh, they're missing that piece of the puzzle. Um, it could be a SaaS business that doesn't have a content strategy, but has a really strong website. So, you know, the site might be a domain authority or domain rating mid eighties, which is very, very strong, but mm -hmm. has no content. And I know for a fact that because that site's so authoritative, if I just smash it with lots of content, that, that could bring in customers, um, you know, you can start adding a lot of revenue to the bottom line. So, um, that's sort of how I tease them apart when I'm thinking, thinking like an operator, I'm thinking, okay, where can I apply my skill set? when I'm thinking 
more like an investor. I'm literally looking for like the drop dead, simple, unfair advantage that I can come in and just make a small tweak and then immediately um, add a lot of revenue. That's interesting. Um, and it helps you kind of protect yourself from any downside in order to, to make sure that you've already kind of got your profit built into the deal. But of course, as an operator, you're also looking to, to really uh, get yourself some efficiencies across your portfolio if possible. And I know that you wanted to talk to us today about scaling teams vertically versus horizontally, how best to go about that and, and a way to apply that to the entire portfolio versus Sometimes you get relationships with contractors as you acquire a site, but they're not really integrated. So uh, I'd like to hear more about what you have to say on that. Yeah, that's a great question. And there was just a big SEO conference in Thailand called the Chiang Mai SEO conference. It's sort of the premier non industry conference. If that makes sense, it's like not, no, there's no Moz people there. Uh, there are some white hats, but it's, it's a mix of like gray and black and, everything under the sun and um, it's put on by Matt Diggity. It's a great conference. But one thing I took away from talking with a lot of other SEO content site portfolio builders like myself is that everybody struggles with this question of how to structure your team. And I remember I talked with Gail and Mark from authority hacker back in 2015. I was living in Budapest and they were there as well. And they were struggling with this question back then. And I think they still struggle with it a little bit to this day. So um, all that said, uh, you know, our process that I'm going to lay out here is, is, is definitely a work in progress, but we tend to try to structure everything in a way that we have fulfillment teams for every type of marketing that we do. And then we have site managers. So the site manager is sort of like, they're basically like the de facto CEO. So if you're, if you're a group of investors, you're a private equity firm, uh, and you're going to acquire a company in a particular industry, you probably know a CEO or C level people that would be really good to manage that business. That's sort of how we think about it on a much smaller scale. So we have really talented site managers who've like basically cut their teeth by being with us for many years, learning all of our processes. And once they've done one site well and got it into sort of management mode, it's a lot less of their time to continue managing that site and we can get them to move into another site in any different niche and quickly repeat the process of building it up, getting it designed well, setting up the social media automations, doing all the keyword research, setting up the link building processes. And they basically establish all those systems uh, for a new site. So that would be an example of, it's kind of vertical integration in a way. They're, they're, it's one person, one site. It's like a money site manager, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then they can tap into the team we have like a social media team, we'll have the writing team, we'll have the link building team, and we have different types of link building. So they tap into all those fulfillment teams to get what they want. But ultimately, you know, we have one sort of boss at each site. And then uh, the teams of fulfillment of the different marketing channels are sort of horizontally spread across the entire portfolio. Gotcha. That makes sense. And when you were growing into this, did you run into any kind of hiccups? Were there models that you tried before that didn't really work? Uh, did this just kind of evolve naturally when you're acquiring sites and you have certain contractors that already were working on things? Um, how did that actually take shape over the years? Yeah, good question. Um, I think we, we found for ourselves, again, this is just for us, that the culture at Next Ventures, if there is one, is basically sort of like a move fast and break things kind of culture. Um, we thrive on really direct extremely honest and often brutal feedback and uh almost every person that's been with us now for several years or more and we're 100 percent remote so we feel that this is this kind of feedback is super valuable because a lot of stuff can get lost in communication when you when you don't have a lot of face-to-face -face time with people but all those people basically went through like a trial by fire phase where we really laid into them there was there might even been yelling and uh and a lot of we've lost a, probably a lot of good people this this way but um, the people that sort of come out on the other end, they respect us and they've learned a lot and they've learned to deal with criticism and, and bounce back from it. And so our best site managers are uh, ones who were, I'll, I'll just lay it out there. They're Eastern Europeans. They, they're sort of younger, um, very ambitious, um, very smart, high aptitude. Um, we saw a lot of potential in them, but there was a, there was a period where at some point where they sort of may have slacked off or they did some kind of sloppy work and really laid it all laid into them quite heavily. And then they just bounced back and were even better. So um, almost everybody who's been with us has, has done that. Um, 
the mistakes that we made were trying to hire expensive out of the gate. So I, I don't think there's a yes, this is a right or wrong thing. It really depends on where your business is at. So for some people hiring a $150,000 a year um, editor or manager uh, is definitely the right move. And we're sort of, you know, we're, we're approaching that level. But uh, for us, we don't really gel well with the like the f- hire fast, fire fast kind of mentality. Uh, we do with uh, with some roles like our writers, um, and certainly if people are not promising in the first few months, then it's it's likely we're going to let them go. But um, we like to we like to train people over the long term, and we've seen that if we spend time with people, they tend to improve and get better and better. Um, and so a lot of the the people that started as sort of VAs, um, but were really smart and sharp, uh, are now our management team. So I guess, uh, a mistake we made, it, it could be, you know, thinking that we're just going to hire somebody and they're going to be good upfront without much training, or even if they plug into our training system from that's from, from a, from a team perspective, for sure. That, that was, uh, that was a mistake we made. Interesting. You mentioned the hire fast, fire fast thing. And I see that come up quite a bit, uh, but the context that you're doing business in I think sometimes that gets lost in the discussion that's handed out in Slack channels or on LinkedIn, Facebook groups, advice that's appropriate for hiring in the context of a funded startup that has money to burn, but it's not accountable to public shareholders uh, is a little bit different from if you have a smaller bootstrap operation, that needs to be profitable and you can't really go try somebody for three months at 150 grand a year and then decide that mm, yeah, it wasn't so great. It's a very risky thing to do. And the management principles that work for these multinational consulting firms to apply to, to publicly traded companies that don't necessarily work uh, at the startup level or at the kind of cash flow positive, profitable, small companies level either. So it's an interesting difference there. Uh, it's, it's interesting how you guys manage to find what works for you. And that kind of work environment, some people thrive in it. You know, as you said, the yelling, the pressure, the trial by fire. Some people really need that, as a matter of fact. And other people would absolutely cry themselves to sleep and have anxiety attacks. So I'm sure you've gotten better at figuring out up front who those people might be. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you focus on quality in SEO and why that matters. Cause you know, you've mentioned, Hey, look, there's gray hat and black hat and anybody who's been around SEO knows that they're, are a variety of things you can do to get more traffic quickly. And then there are things that you're supposed to do if you're going to make public blog posts about it. And then there's what actually happens. So why don't you give us your thoughts on that quality versus quantity situation? This is a really good thing. I think it would warrant a uh, several hours discussion <laughs> in another podcast, but I mean, this is where our head is at uh, all day, every day is, um, how to do extremely high quality SEO work. And I think it's, uh, it's, again, this is a differentiator for what sets our portfolio apart. And when we talk about quality, I'm, I'm specifically referring to links and content, content quality. It's pretty easy to tell most people listening can say, this is good writing. This is captivating. This is engaging. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's informative. It's might be funny, but links, um, you know, you have to know SEO to know what a really quality link is, but, uh, we adopted this mindset and maybe first just to explain when we build links, we do a type of link building that is basically editorial guest posting, but guest posting is probably the wrong connotation because it's not a one-off guest post. It's like every site that we reach out to is basically a major media outlet of some kind. We're talking like not necessarily the New York times, like, you know, top 10 news organizations in the world, but like huge magazines in our niche, maybe technology, big data, IT, cybersecurity, stuff like that. And we want columns on those so we can repeatedly link to our sites over and over and over again. And getting these is quite difficult because they don't accept guest posts. They only accept columnists. They often want to pay the writers, which is good, but can introduce some issues as well when you're trying to get paid. But that's basically what we're doing. We're trying to get columns on these really, really strong websites and then continually link to ourselves or our we still have a portfolio of clients from those columns. And so getting those is this very high touch. There's a lot of email back and forth that goes in. Uh, the content itself has to be very well written. Getting links in them, particularly if the, the sites are averse to links, can be very tricky. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, all that said is the types of links we get are substantially higher quality than most other 
affiliates that we're competing against. Mm -hmm. And we adopted this mindset because alongside building our portfolio, we, I had a couple of clients from my previous consulting life who were, and still are based on the top, top affiliates in some of the most competitive niches on the internet. And I would come to them with a uh, possible sites that I was writing for, and they would repeatedly shut down the sites because they said, no, we only want the absolute best links. And that sort of differentiated them from their competitors as well. Uh, and is one of the reasons why they do so well um, is that they just have a very, very high quality standards. So we sort of adopted that mentality. Um, also C and I are a bit of perfectionists ourselves. And um, I don't necessarily think this is a good way to approach it for everybody because there's ways that people build these content sites that are extremely effective without being extremely anal about link quality and, right. and uh, having really high standards. Right. Um, people build some really great sites with PBNs and then slowly phase out of the PBNs. Um, some people do a really good job with like massive scale guest posting campaigns. But that said, I think the game is changing substantially. I think PBNs are will be around for a while, but I think like the lower tier to medium tier guest posting is not, it's either not effective now or is like negatively effective and is a huge risk. So yeah. I think it's put us in a very good position where now we have this sort of snowball of momentum of all these columns we've built and these processes for getting these columns. And uh, yeah, so I mean, you said low quality sites are getting squeezed more rapidly. Um, you know, I think that is a testament to the fact that we're seeing sites like Business Insider ranking for stuff like best blender reviews uh, and New York, New York mag ranking for stuff. That's like best beard trimmer. Right. Um, so these, these sites have realized that Google has the Google's algorithm thinks that they're relevant for just any topic. Right. So because their display ad budgets are being squeezed, they're saying let's smash our sites with all sorts of Amazon affiliate content to recoup that revenue. And so that's why, you know, the blender review guy dot net despite the fact that he might have a beautiful site and, you know, actually test all the blenders himself, Business Insider comes along and publishes one 500 word article that crushes him for his main keyword. So right. um, that can put a business out of, um, out of commission overnight. So yeah, I think to continue succeeding as an affiliate and particularly succeeding well and making a lot of money uh, with big authority sites, you really need to, uh, to be more aggressive and, think a little bit higher level about the types of links that you're going for. And that's what we try to do. Yeah. That sounds like it would be time and resource intensive, but the long-term risk management benefits are absolutely apparent there. Um, particularly since every time there's any update in, in the Google side of things, everybody's like nervous. Oh no, <laughs> what's going to happen. And if you're feeling that happening on a consistent basis, that's not a great way to build a portfolio over the course of years. So quality focus is key. However, I'm curious, since you guys are so SEO focused, the organic traffic is obviously ideal um, in that context, but do you diversify your traffic source as much? Do you try to build email lists? I mean, how are you addressing that or do you not bother? Yeah, I think that the answer to this is it depends on the site. We've had success building a news news plus affiliate site uh, because all the sites we build are like essentially large brands. If we publish news industry news, then that uh, news a it's a good traffic play because um, you can get into Google news and um, if you get into Google news, you know, it's just a lot of traffic. It's a lot of potential traffic. One of your news stories could blow up. You could get a hundred thousand people overnight. Um, but it's also really, really good link bait. Um, if you have, if you keep in mind that a very, very small percentage of any journalist that reaches your site, whether it's just strictly affiliate or news plus affiliate, but particularly with news, um, is just looking for a citation. You know, it's somebody that has a content quota that they're writing for their site. Let's say it's, let's say it's a journalist for business insider and yeah. you know, they have thousands of thousands of journalists that have a, a very strict quota of how much content they have to pump out each week. Uh, and so they need to find sources for their content. And so they just, they'll just go and, you know, like, like anybody writing an article, you try to find something to link to that makes sense. It isn't a competitor. Uh, and so if you just have lots of news content, it's a, it's actually a quite an effective link building strategy without doing any proactive outreach. And then that traffic that, you know, the link equity parlays into better rankings for your affiliate content, but, um, news traffic aside, uh, we definitely, for sure, an email list is like 
the number one thing for us outside of just the SEO traffic. We don't do like a hyper segmented email lists or like offers or anything like that. It's just not part of our core business. But what we have had success with is just capturing the email with a very, very basic opt-in like, Hey, do you want discounts on the thing that you came here for with whatever the site is about? Uh, do you want discounts on that? The opt-in is quite high. It's usually either an in-content, you know, uh, call to action or an exit intent pop-up. And then we regularly just send them like a weekly or buy like a, or like twice a weekly deals email. Hey, did you know that there's a discount on this thing? Or we have our VAs just find some discounts in the niche, put our affiliate link in there and then just send these out. And that actually, uh, the one we just exited that added about 20% of the, the revenue to the site. So that was, uh, and it was, and we clean the list regularly. So yeah, it's definitely an email, you know, the money's in the list. Um, it's, it's a definitely a super effective way to, to diversify. Also with news, you can, you know, you can build a, a Twitter account that's sort of a Twitter, its own publishing platform. You're just publishing all the news that you're putting out. Um, and then occasionally throwing in like maybe once every 20 tweets, throwing in like your affiliate content, but just sharing industry stuff. I'm not sure how well that converts. It's probably more of a branding play. Right. Uh, we found that social media is its own beast as everybody's aware. So to do it, to do it properly, you really need somebody that's like a no social media and it's going to really go hard on it. But um, yeah, SEO plus email, that's our bread and butter. Hmm, cool. Yeah. That's definitely something that we have looked at quite a bit. And as far as the social media stuff, we're interested in working with people who know more about it. We see a lot of Pinterest stuff happening, obviously um, Facebook and Instagram have been really big for a long time, but it is a, it's one of those things where we certainly shy away from anything that's over dependent on social traffic because it seems so fickle. And I know that's um, ironic because we're talking about SEO <laughs> for the most part here, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's the devil, you know? So what do you think is happening in SEO now and, and where's the industry headed in light of what you said about this focus on quality? SEO is obviously usually responding to shifts in Google and uh, their policies and their focus. So I'm curious to see what you think on macro level where things are going to be at the next five years yeah good question there's a really there's a really good report that i think you should probably link to in the show notes here called the awin report awin is a large affiliate network and they just published like a state of affiliate marketing and they bring on like major major agencies and major major brands and what i'm seeing now and what i've considered with some some people is marketing agencies let's say 20 years ago in the online marketing space, they just did one particular thing, pay traffic or SEO, and then quickly became, okay, you need to offer a suite of services. So all the best marketing agencies, it's an integrated digital marketing. But if you take like the top 10 in the U S what they'll, they all have huge clients, like, you know, household names like Pepsi, Coke, yada, 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 stuff like that. Uh, their clients come to them and say, okay, we, we know this affiliate stuff is important. And how do we take advantage of that? So agencies now have a, it's like SEO, PPC, social affiliate, and they'll go with these large brands and actually help them build affiliate programs. And this is not new, but it's now becoming more ubiquitous mm -hmm. where big brands are starting to court affiliates more and more and more because they, are, they have a very close relationship with customers. So on one level, there's an element of affiliate marketing is, is, dying but not dying is transforming because these major media sites can now see that they can quickly publish affiliate content that they hadn't published before best whatever whether it's a blender a piece of software and they'll immediately rank without any link building and they'll crush everybody um so on that note becoming an authority site is harder but if you've sort of been able to get to the authority level then you're in a really really good position so the barrier to entry is much much higher but if you can get past that barrier then you're sort of like in the club. And that's sort of what I'm seeing uh, with particularly affiliate marketing, but I think there presents a huge opportunity. And this is a, a, an area that I'm super excited about is looking for, uh, looking for niches where there isn't a huge affiliate presence. So there could be, there could be traditional businesses like energy, utilities, gas, finance, whatever, that are just 100% offline or have just a basic corporate website, but that could benefit tremendously from 
tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of websites that already have content about that, but they aren't monetizing. You reach right. out to those people, you court them, you build an affiliate relationship. I think that um, proactive ability to uh, build an affiliate as a channel is basically going to be where the SEO industry is headed generally over the last next few years. That's an interesting angle on things. So really looking at it from the perspective of the, the maturity of the affiliate marketing model, you have different sorts of referral marketing that's been around with larger brands for a while, but they didn't necessarily incentivize it on a commission basis where they're working with publishers. Their angle was more like, you know, invite a friend, get 10 bucks or whatever. So this, this shift towards affiliate marketing being used by the larger brands, um, do you feel that that was perhaps brought about by Amazon uh, the Amazon associates program, sort of legitimizing publisher oriented affiliate marketing, uh, when for instance, ClickBank or commission junction or something, they didn't necessarily do that quite as well in terms of legitimizing it on a mass level. Yeah. 100%. Uh, Amazon gave people the ability to monetize traffic about just about any product. And so it's now, I think it's well understood from people doing product searches in Google that they're going to arrive on some site that's a review site or a curated review site of some kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think Amazon was definitely a key part of that for sure. Yeah. That's something that I've kind of noticed because I, I didn't really become aware of Amazon associate stuff until I think 2009 or 2010. I'm not sure exactly when it started, but that was sort of new at the time. It was interesting. And still at that time, though, affiliate marketing in a general sense had kind of a little bit of a black eye uh, relative to other aspects of marketing. So it's interesting to see how that shifted over the years and, and how it's been perceived differently. You know, we had talked a little bit about some of the mistakes, uh, some of the challenges from the hiring to the team development and, and your attempts at making uh, other content sites work earlier on, you know, when you're in Saigon and such. What were some of the key mistakes, you know, maybe just one that taught you the strongest lesson and that you'd like the people who are listening or watching this to take away? Yeah. So from a, from a buyer's perspective, just without sharing our entire strategy, like we find, like I'm sure a lot of SEOs are doing are looking for sites that have a lot of upside potential. So these could be expired domains, they could be auction domains, they could be abandoned sites. So sites that are still alive, but have like clearly not been updated in a long time. And what SEOs are doing is basically trying to find these and then repurposing them for some sort of commercial type site, affiliate site of some kind. And why this matters is because if you find one that works, you basically, let's just run the numbers we spend for our extremely high quality links, so to speak, uh, we spend anywhere from 300 to a thousand dollars per link in terms of all the OPEX that goes into it and potentially more. Um, and that's the market value for some of those is, is two to three or four X that. So we can sell those for a lot as well, but, um, let's just put it as $500 per link. Let's say you find a domain in a particular niche that's abandoned that has 4,000 referring domains of which let's just say half are really, really good. 2000 times 500. What is that? A million dollars. So you're looking at it. Basically you've saved a million dollars and several years of grind, um, that you would have had to do in building those links. Mm. if that link equity is sort of upheld and that's the big question is, is are you buying stuff that the links still pass juice, so to speak? Uh, because if you buy it and the links have gone stale or Google doesn't recognize them for whatever reason, and there's a lot of reasons why that could happen, mm. uh, then it's, 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 it's sort of a dud. And so in approaching these, uh, we had a couple ideas on how to mi uh, minimize the risk. One of which was when we find the site, if it's live, live sites are ideal for a lot of reasons, asking them to publish guest posts or some test content, so to speak. And one of our sort of most ambitious buys to date, this was about a year ago, we were really gung ho. We structured the purchase agreement through escrow as a lump sum plus a large earnout. And uh, we, we had considered asking them to let us do some test content. And uh, we said, nah, they'll never let us do that. They'll never let us do that. So let's not even ask. We don't want to ruin the deal. Mm -hmm. And then site turned out to be a dud. So we lost a very large investment, uh, mid five figures, and we're still paying for it because we're still doing, we're still in the earn out phase or the payout phase. But, yeah. uh, but now we've, we've been through about eight others since then, and they've all agreed to do test content. 
there's a bit of friction, but it's worth it because if the site is super relevant for what you're trying to turn it into, uh, let me give an example. Let's say you have a site that's like, let's say it's an old dentist organization or dentist conference, and you're trying to turn it into a dental lead gen site or maybe a site about dental products. And you tell, you publish something like best electric toothbrush and it doesn't rank immediately or within at least a couple of days, that site, you should not proceed with it. Uh, and so the test content is really important with that model. And, you know, I think we were just, it was a new, it was a new thing for us finding these strong domains. We were really excited about it and we were worried that we we're going to lose the deal. Right. Um, so I think just, you know, crossing all your T's, dotting all your I's and, and trying to know whether the site is going to be good beforehand is extremely important. You know, I said live sites are preferable because if you have an expired domain, you don't know if those links are even still valuable. You know, a, a SEO tool like Ahrefs or SMrush or Moz is going to tell you that the domain is strong because it has those little links, but it's not going to tell you if those links are still good. And if you publish content, it's still going to rank. So mm -hmm. expired domains are like the most risky. Auction domains are a little bit better because they, they're still indexed. So the, like the site is technically still indexed, even though it's like, uh, sorry, parked domains. Um, park domains are still indexed. Um, auction domains may or may not be indexed. So there's all these different ones at the, at the end of the different ends of the spectrum. But if you have a site that's still live, that still has traffic, that's like product market fit in a sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go live traffic and has cash flow, uh, that's an actual website business and you know it has product market fit because people are paying for it. But um, right. you're also going to be paying a premium on that. So if you can find stuff that like has the upside potential of half a million or several million dollars based on the link equity, uh, try to test it as much as possible uh, mm. so you can avoid getting burned like we did. Yeah, that's a really interesting move. Uh, I think that's going to be valuable information for people that are listening. And I appreciate you sharing that. Obviously, it sucks to lose uh, any money, um, and especially if it's mid five figures for something that you you felt like you should test and then you ended up not doing it. It kind of reminds me of a time when I thought, oh, I'm just going to leave the car for a second. Oh, put your backpack in the trunk. Nah, don't be weird. Don't make it weird. Came back, windows smashed, backpack's gone. So <laughs> listen oh, to that man. gut feeling. Listen to it when, when you're concerned. Test, uh, do test things. And, uh, you know, re-listen to this episode if you're not sure how to go about that process. <laughs> so, it, you know, you mentioned the value of those links. And I know that you guys have a business called bluetree.ai. Is that a similar thing? Can you tell us about that and how that, uh, how that works? Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, Blue Tree is an agency that we have. And because our core portfolio up to this point has been bootstrapped. And so we were building these types of links for ourselves because we're in, we're in competitive niches. Uh, and we quickly attracted the attention of a lot of other uh, affiliates who want similar links. So, so it just evolved naturally. We, we didn't set out to build an agency, but we get, we got so many inquiries for high ticket links that we decided to put up a website, make it official. And so, yeah, now we do get, uh, we get inquiries through there and most of our clients have come through referral. Um, we, we picked up a couple of clients. I spoke at DCBKK this year and got a couple of clients there. And then, uh, as I said, my business partner spoke at Chiang Mai, um, and uh, we got uh, a client or two there. So if you're the type of business or I guess portfolio owner who has sites in very, very competitive niches and has a, a large appetite for strong links, then we can definitely help because that's, that's our, that's what we do. Cool. Yeah. It seems like it'd be a bit of a difficult thing to wrap your head around if you've never done it before. And sometimes it's best to, to uh, work with people who have, good proven experience doing it. So do check that out. It's bluetree.ai if that's something you're interested in. Uh, you know, you guys also have your Next Ventures website at nextventures.group. There's a careers page. You're looking for a couple different people. If that's still active, I'm not sure. So why don't you tell us about how people can best get in contact with you and learn more if they're interested in working with you? Yeah, cheers, man. Uh, just dan at nextventures.group. The, the website is actually nextventures.group. So that's the domain name. Uh, so Dan at nextventures.group. We look for, again, sites that sort of integrate into our portfolio. We're also looking to partner with or acquire other agencies that have similar processes to ours. So link building SEO agencies are on our list as well, just so we can accelerate the processes that we already have in place and sort of combine them. But if you, if you want to ask about anything I talked about here or 
just want to talk about SEO or link building, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm focused on this stuff all day, every day. So I like to, I like to meet other people who are doing the same stuff. Well, thank you. It's been very informative. It's a lot of valuable information. Uh, we appreciate you inviting people to get in contact with you. Congratulations again on the exit. Congratulations on the success so far. And I will talk to you soon. Dan Fries, thanks. Cheers, man. Domain Magnet is a leader in buying and selling online businesses with a proven track record of expertise gained from over 300 deals since 2004. To learn more about how we can help you acquire or exit a profitable online business today, head over to DomainMagnet.com for more details.